by way of introduction, my name is Ross Dixon, and I'm a senior manager here at RSM Australia in our Albury office. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. Obviously, this is the first in a series of webinars, which is going to be focused on manufacturing running for the next three months. To those of you who have attended our in-person events last year, welcome back. And to those of you who it's your, your first one that you're attending virtually, then it's nice to meet you. Um, it's great to see the take up for the webinar has been so strong with uh, in excess of 80 businesses signing up to attend today or receive the recording. And plus this will be shared across the numerous networks that are obviously being represented today. Um, so, just to give you a bit of context, RSM is an accounting and consulting firm with 30 offices across Australia. Uh, RSM in particular, we've got a strong presence uh, across both metro and regional, but we are dedicated to building and supporting capability in the manufacturing sector. Currently, we're supporting a number of clients on their export journey through things such as structuring, international tax, R&D tax incentives, export market development grants, as well as those traditional suite of accounting services. RSM is also the sixth biggest accounting network in the world with presence in excess of 100 countries. Um, we've been able to use that to, to leverage our networks internationally, which has been good. But what I want to talk about today is uh, the presenters. Obviously, you can see it is a great group of uh, presenters we've managed to cobble together. Michael Sharp, he's the National Director uh, for Industry of the Advanced Manufacturing Growth Centre. Obviously, many of you have already had uh members of the amgc and have had contact with michael previously so thank michael for his presence today we've got wayne murphy who's a senior export advisor from investment new south wales and also representing austrade uh, and leon scaliotis and i apologies leon i, I practiced him i've got your name wrong i do apologize and he's the general manager of flavor tech who obviously as you're sure you're all aware are an award-winning exporter so just before we begin and we get to the bit that you're all here for to see the speakers, just a slight piece of housekeeping. Well, the webinar is going to be recorded. Uh, we'll make this recording uh, available to the participants. Uh, there's going to be a panel discussion at the end. So if we could put the questions in the Q&A box uh, or the chat, if you're happy for everyone else to see, that'd be great. Towards the end, we'll start to facilitate that roundtable uh, conversation. For the purposes of this, all, uh, all participants, everyone here will be, will be muted. And uh, for any more information about the speakers or the topics, you'll obviously get, you'll get a circular email that goes after this, but feel free to drop onto the RSM website or email myself directly. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to pass you to Michael Shaw. Michael is the National Director for Industry at the AMGC. The AMGC's goal is to drive innovation, productivity, competitiveness across Australia. And the AMGC is run by a team of industry experts. So if you don't mind, Michael, I'll, I'll pass on to yourself. Great, thanks Ross, and good to be here and good to see my fellow uh, panel speakers. It's uh, always good to get together. I think with this lockdown, I think now more and more, if we can get together and support each other, it's vitally important. Uh, that's my experience. And certainly doing back-to-back -back Zoom calls, as I'm sure most of us are, uh, every now and then it's good to just pick up the phone separately and just talk to people, uh, get that support, get that encouragement, find out what the manufacturer down the road is doing. Uh, quite often you get that support network uh, going as well. I guess I just wanted to share a few highlights of what we've been doing at AMGC. Uh, certainly the whole world now is talking about manufacturing and we always encourage for Australian manufacturers to look at every opportunity to export. And I know that uh, Leon's going to talk about all the successful work that Flavortech are doing, certainly a leader in their field. So look forward to hearing from Leon shortly. Um, our latest report is the... Um, perceptions report. You can download that from our AMGC website. Uh, it's our latest research where we engage with members of the public and manufacturers, big and small, all over the country. And it's shown a massive uplift since 2019 to now in the way that people appreciate and uh, acknowledge manufacturing. What can we make in Australia? What can we export to the world? So I'd encourage you all to look at that uh, perceptions report, uh, but also in addition, uh, last month, we released the sector competitiveness plan. So that's our latest uh, snapshot of manufacturing for Australia, what it means to be advanced. And it's got a whole heap of research there for you to have a look at, uh, get involved with, reach out to me or my colleagues, and uh, we're keen to help and support you. Um, and then there's all the various grant opportunities, of course. And some of you would have seen and um, our latest uh, agreement with the Northern Territory Government around uh, manufacturing projects where we can co-fund uh, projects that have 
collaboration with Northern Territory manufacturers. So if you're looking for any uh, support, if you've got um, looking for manufacturing uh, capacity, uh, feel free to reach out. And if there's an opportunity there, I'm happy to make those connections. I thought I would share some local examples. It was great to be down with you all in Albury um, before the late, la latest lockdown. Uh, nothing better for me than to get out on the factory floor and hit the road. And I know most of you normally see me uh, in the mobile Zoom studio or my car. Um, so it's good to be uh, talking with at least. But a couple of companies that come to mind is Flip Screen in Wagga, um, doing great things, just received significant grant support from the federal government. Uh, and they're exporting all around the world with their flip screen technology. Have a look at their website and you'll see some of the work that they're doing. Um, Shingleback Off-Road, uh, you know, doing great stuff. And I think during COVID lockdown, you're seeing that company just expand because suddenly uh, everyone wants to buy more push bikes and get out in the nature and go riding with their family and they need the bike rack to go with it. So Shingleback Off-Road are doing great things on their Instagram feed and um, selling their products uh, to the wider community and out to the world. Uh, so I always encourage people to look at how you can sell your products. A lot of you out there are terrific at making things and perhaps not so good at selling those things. Uh, and today, the technology that's available, think about Instagram, it costs nothing. It's completely free. But if you can uh, get it right, your message goes out to the whole entire world. And uh, Shingleback Off-Road is a good example of that. Um, the other one is uh, Chameleon uh, AMLS. I was able to connect them. Uh, I'm sure they're on here on the call. Uh, so I was able to connect them with uh, Red Arc Electronics over in Adelaide. And to give you an example of what's happened during COVID and the lockdown and all the rest, manufacturing continues to expand. Um, we've been able to support uh, supply chains and bring people together uh, like this scenario, um, just to show what's capable and what opportunities might be out there for you and your business. Um, but Red Arc is a highlight uh, based in Adelaide, exporting globally. During COVID, during just the last 18 months, they've employed an additional 70 staff. And these are higher skilled jobs around automation, robotics, electronics. Um, they're upskilling their workforce and taking the opportunity to look for export opportunities to grow the business. And it's certainly having a, a beneficial impact on their local community. Um, the staff are seeing that you know, they're able to upskill and learn more themselves. And so it's just a very broad opportunity. Um, can I point you all to the Manufacturing Academy? Uh, now that's a separate platform that we've built uh, at manufacturingacademy.com.au. Uh, I've been able to interview our members all around the country. Uh, you'll see some great resources on there. It's an online learning platform. Uh, the latest uh, module we've put on is around circular economy. And I know some of you met uh, Professor Veena Sahajwala when I brought uh, her down to Albury uh, beginning of last year. Uh, we visited some of the local businesses and uh, it was great to bring Veena with me out of the University of New South Wales to share her experience about uh, all things recycling, uh, perhaps recycling electronic waste, uh, but all sorts of plastics and, and other materials. Um, so uh, Veena features on the Manufacturing Academy and you can hear from her uh, about the latest opportunities in advanced manufacturing. And I'm sure that can help many businesses across the spectrum because now with the opportunities in recycled materials and government assistance available to help that transition, um, there's growing uh, opportunities for your business. Um, I wanted to, Ross, I hope you got to see Landline on Sunday. Um, it was a great episode this week because Landline showed uh, one of our members a company called Davos Fencing Clip. And so have a look at Davos Fencing Clip on Facebook in particular. Uh, Nicole Davidson uh, and her husband, Rod, have invented a better way to uh, clip the fencing wire onto timber posts. Uh, it's an Australian innovation off the farm from their farm in regional Victoria. I was able to visit them at Casterton uh, before lockdown and see the fabulous work that they've done to develop their own machinery to make uh, bending wire and shaping it into the Davos fencing clip. Again, off their Facebook, they're selling that product all around the world. And the landline episode, which you can watch on ABC iView, um, shares their story and their journey from being on the land and finding a need and finding a solution to their problem and now making money from that solution. It's a great manufacturing su success story and the way they're able to sell their story to me is important. That sales and marketing opportunity for export um, is the key driver in my opinion. Uh, I would just close at this stage and I'm happy to engage and take questions throughout, Ross, as always. 
Um, but I would point everyone to Export Finance Australia and Mike Reznikoff and his colleagues uh, at Export Finance Australia are more than willing to support your business along this journey to become uh, more export ready. Or if you're already exporting, there's other options where they can assist you. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me at any time and I'm happy to make these connections and support your business now and into the future because the exciting thing is that uh, manufacturing is being respected so much more. Uh, we're so much more than what people consider, you know, the old smokestacks and the old factories. Manufacturing today is so much more than that and it's a, a very exciting time to be in manufacturing in Australia today. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, Ross, and uh, happy to take questions. Thanks, Michael. We'll, uh, we've got a few questions that are coming through the Q&A that we'll look to maybe ask at the end as part of the panel, if that's okay. Uh, and thanks again for that, Michael. Really interesting and great to see so many examples, obviously, in a regional manufacturing context. Uh, on behalf of RSM, I want to thank you. You've obviously been a great support for us uh, with this programme over the last year, so we appreciate that. And, and thanks again for supporting regional manufacturers as well as manufacturers across the country. Uh, our next speaker is Wayne Murphy, who's a Senior Export Advisor from Investment New South Wales and also works with Austrade. Wayne uh, is an experienced trade facilitator with knowledge, skills and networks to assist regional businesses seeking sustained growth by exporting their products or services into international markets. Assistance includes developing export capabilities of the business, identifying new partners, customers or end users, matching potential trade opportunities and addressing in-market issues. Um, obviously, a lot of you have already had contact with, with Wayne. So we, uh, for those of you who have met him before, that's great, but I'll, I'll pass you now to Wayne. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you, Ross. Uh, and thank you to RSM for the opportunity to participate uh, in today's activity. And it's great to uh, make contact uh, albeit virtually with, uh, with Michael, who I haven't seen for a while, and also uh, to Leon. Um, I'm uh, Wayne Murphy, as Ross pointed out. I'm with the New South Wales government, currently working in the Trade and International team within Investment New South Wales. Uh, I think it was, uh, took some notes there as Michael was talking, and whilst there'll be a bit of information here, uh, which is available, as Ross pointed out later, uh, I think a couple of the key points, um, our capabilities around make in terms of manufacturing is, is extremely strong. And what I'd like to focus on today is the elements of marketing and selling the ability to help assist your business to market and sell those uh, internationally. Uh, hopefully everyone, if someone could just let me know if they could see those slides. Yep, all good, Wayne. Thanks, Ross. Uh, I am with the New South Wales Government and I'll explain uh, the association with Austrade, which is the Australian Trade and Investment Commission. I do know that there uh, may be businesses on today's call that are from other parts of the country. Uh, and as in New South Wales, uh, many of the uh, state and territory governments uh, also support their exporters. And so I encourage you to make contact uh, with those. That includes uh, your ACT Government, Trade and Investment Queensland, Department for Trade and Investment in South Australia, et cetera. We talk about the manufacturing, Australia's manufacturing exports, and obviously we have a proud history of that. Um, as we know, Australia is the country that gave birth to the ultrasound scanner, the black box flight recorder, and the bionic ear, as among many. Uh, as we can see there with our contribution, it's a hundred billion dollar plus, output and one of the fastest growing export sectors, hence the focus today. Here in New South Wales, our manufacturers generate approximately a third of that with uh, a strong employment footprint, which is incredibly important, and one of the state's largest export sectors, which is also growing considerably. The key is then you'll be asking, well, how can we assist you? Well, what we aim to do with the services from government is to assist you reduce the time, cost and risk of exporting. And obviously those are elements, depending on where you are, what your business is, 
and what the product is that you're exporting and to the markets that you may be exporting to, any one or combination of those can be, um, can be incredibly important and provide opportunity for your business or areas that you need to maybe focus on. In addition to that, uh, the government agencies offer insights, information and services that will help you on your global business journey. And to complement that is obviously a suite of services to help you build that confidence, grow your skills and continue to grow global growth for your particular business. Here in New South Wales, uh, we have a range of support services. Um, I haven't listed all of them, but just to highlight a few. Currently, we have the New South Wales Export Assistance Grant that uh, provides reimbursement of eligible expenses, as you can see, up to $10,000. Uh, that program uh, was due to conclude in June, but it's been extended till the 30th of December. Uh, we have an e-commerce program for those that are uh, e-commerce, very important channel to market in many sectors. Uh, we have a program there that, that is uh, providing a whole range of business support services. And we've just launched the Going Global Export Program for 2021-22, which is designed to support the growth of businesses through uh, expansion into new export markets with some uh, coaching, tailored workshops and targeted business matching for businesses into international markets. Uh, we'll cover 10 markets and as you can see, uh, some sectors that we will be focusing on in this year's program. Um, several of those uh, are manufacturing focused. To support that, we have uh, a team of export advisors who are experienced trade professionals located across regional New South Wales and in Greater Sydney. We've just employed some specialist technology sector focused advisors, which will complement that. Uh, and we also have a international network of offices for the New South Wales government. Uh, which will be expanding through funding that was committed in the 2021-22 New South Wales budget. And that will increase our presence and footprint to assist exporters in international markets. At the federal level um, is, is Austrade. And Austrade is there to assist the businesses uh, equally through the stages of their exporting. As you can see, depending on where you are in your export journey, some of you may only be looking to explore possibilities. You may have received some inquiries or your business plan may have changed and you may be looking to do that. Some of you may be already in, 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 in a market and are looking to consolidate that. Others uh, maybe already have built some momentum and are looking to capitalise on that. Others then are looking to manage a portfolio and continue to grow their business. To support the businesses, depending on where you are, uh, Austrade and its partners have a comprehensive suite of services. Um, that's a mixture of digital and one-to-many services. As you can see, moves through advice, advisory services with uh, the 1-3 number into webinar and seminars, which many of you may have already attended and participated in. Uh, into a very comprehensive suite of digital services, which include market profiles, trade information, um, and guides to exporting. And international education obviously is, is an area of uh, focus as well. Uh, for those businesses that have been identified, uh, there are a customized support services. And again, depending on the stage of the business's growth and what areas they may be operating in, then there are categories there that the government services are tailored to support. And you can see the range of support services, some of which we will cover briefly, there to complement um, those both digital and uh, tailored accelerate services to clients. The digital uh, services, as you can see, is there as a, as a bit of a self-serve option for businesses. Obviously, we're spending a lot more time these days uh, due to COVID. Um, but digital access is very important. And you can see from the Austrade website and the advisory services uh, into some of the new digital tools, um, which includes the export market profile access, uh, the find export markets tool, 
and the broad suite of trade information services that is now available from the export.business.gov.au website, which is a very good, um, easily accessible tool for many businesses to do some of their own research in their own time to assist in their export journey. However, we do know, whilst it's not possible to physically engage, many businesses do value the opportunity to have, as Michael pointed out, and as many of us uh, uh, find value in, is face-to-face -face engagement. And Austrade and its partners uh, operate the Trade Start Network. And the Trade Start Network is simply as an extension of Austrade's own offices and delivered in partnership with state, territory, local government, industry association, and chambers of commerce across Australia. So the network is quite strong. Uh, as you can see there, um, covers the New South Wales team that I mentioned earlier, including uh, two of our representatives in the Sydney region, but also across all states and territories, as you can see. And that gives you somebody that uh, is local and that you can make contact with that can help guide uh, some of your areas of interest in exporting uh, in those market and looking to sell into international markets. Um, some of you may have already um, had contact and worked quite extensively with your Trade Start Advisor. What the Trade Start Advisors do, is it, as we pointed out, is connects um, your business to Austrade's global network, gives you global reach uh, into the major trade and investment markets around the world. And here you'll see Austrade's footprint. Uh, this includes local and Australian based staff. And again, many of you, uh, if you've worked with Austrade uh, either directly or through a Trade Start Advisor, uh, would have worked uh, with a business development manager in one of their foreign markets. And I think if you have, uh, many of you would agree that they are extremely uh, knowledgeable. They have great local contacts, networks. Their local language skills are invaluable. Uh, they can provide market specific insights and advice and importantly, uh, on the ground information and delivery of services, including business matching for you into their respective markets. Financial support is obviously important for businesses. And um, here is a range of services or support that is available. Uh, it was mentioned and we do work closely with Export Finance Australia um, and information is available from their website or again through your local Trade Start advisor you can make an introduction. Uh, you'll see, as I said, state and territory governments uh, operate funding programs to support exporters. Um, there are duty drawback and trade schemes also available from the federal government uh, for many that are involved in manufacturing of uh, or processing of high value uh, perishable products that were impacted by COVID through the reduction in international air freight services, you'll know, uh, would most likely have utilized the International Freight Assistance Mechanism, IFAM, which was uh, funding and support provided by the federal government to help move those, credit, those high value products, continue servicing uh, our important clients, but equally to bring um, important uh, medical supplies and into back to Australia. Um, I would encourage people to look at the business.gov.au website. There is a grant and programs find the link there um, and that can be localized by putting in your postcode, what industry you're in. And that's a very valuable tool because it covers, uh, it gives a listing of, of programs and financial support across uh, many government agencies, both state, local and federal. So I do encourage you there. Uh, I will spend a little bit of time though on um, a key program, which is the Export, Export Market Development Grants Program, or more commonly known as EMDG. And again, if you've been involved in exporting, uh, you may have utilized this service program in the past. Uh, EMDG has traditionally been a reimbursement scheme. However, uh, due to some changes in this financial year, um, the reimbursement scheme will continue to be available, uh, but it will also be uh, progressing to a eligibility-based grant program. So those who have uh, previously used the, the uh, former reimbursement scheme, that will be available for expenses, eligible expenses incurred up to the 30th of June uh, of 2021. However, 
for businesses that may wish to utilize the grant program that will be also available from the 1st of July of this year. And the, the, the revised program um, has some key features to it. They've simplified the legislation. They're looking to provide a streamlined application program process. Uh, you can apply once for grants up to two or three years in advance. And really importantly, based on feedback that they got, the government received, uh, business was, will have some certainty around what funding they will be receiving uh, before they incur their expenditure. A little bit of information on the program there. It has been designed to support exporters at different uh, stages of their export journey or, or uh, tiers, as you can see there. Those uh, tiers uh, ready to export for tier one and the funding there up to two years, $40,000 per financial year. Uh, I will note that the funding is uh, a matched funding. So you are required to commit um, the 50% equivalent of the funding grant that you may receive. Uh, you'll see their tiers two and three and what their qualifications are. The eligibility around it um, for the business has to have uh, be eligible and you'll see the requirements there. Uh, and your products, which can be goods, services, events, intellectual property and software also uh, need to be eligible for the program. If you have utilised the program before, you'll notice that uh, the categories for eligible expenses hasn't uh, changed. Uh, but one of the ones that has been added, which is there for those tier one new exporters, which is important, is that they are able to obtain grants for um, building their export readiness, which again is important to the long-term success in export markets. For many of those other activities, um, COVID may have had some impact on our ability to travel. However, preparing uh, and marketing digitally, uh, and online, uh, continuing to protect your intellectual property, all those aspects are still available through the Export Market Development Grants Program. Applications are open now and they will close on the 30th of November. And there's a simple five-step process to do that. It's governed uh, by, the new program is governed by uh, three areas there. You'll see the, the, the act, the rules and the guidelines. And I do encourage people to um, have a look at those. Uh, it's all available from austrade.gov.au forward slash EMDG. Uh, and it's probably a good idea if you are interested in the program to sign up for Austrade's EMDG update, which is also available. Uh, Ross asked me to just look at also free trade agreements. It's another tool that may be available to you as a manufacturing exporter to help um, market and sell your products competitively into global, uh, global markets and to customers. And simply the free trade agreements an international treaty between two or more economies that reduces or eliminates some barriers to trade. Australia negotiates those to the benefit of our Australian exporters, importers, producers and investors by trying, as we say, to reduce and eliminate certain barriers. Australia has a range of free trade agreements uh, in force currently, going back to 1983 with Australia and New Zealand. Um, you'll see there the, uh, a range of those, including the, the uh, three key North Asia markets, um, right through to the most recent one, which was the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, or more commonly known as IACEPA. Those uh, that's been concluded, but not yet in force, which means that the agreement's been concluded, signed by the relevant um, governments, but not yet enacted into law. Uh, and those that importantly for Australia that uh, give us new opportunities, you can see there um, most recently is the Australia United Kingdom. Also negotiations are ongoing with the European Union, uh, India and the Gulf Cooperation Council or GCC company, countries. Again, I'll encourage you, Austria, to have a great range of resources regarding FTAs. Um, there's some recordings on FTA seminars. There is the uh, DFAT website, which gives more detail of respective FTAs. And again, if you haven't utilized it, I would suggest you have a look at the FTA portal. The FTA portal um, gives you some really good information 
on um, understanding based on your HS code. And if you've exported, that's your harmonized system code. Um, if you're unsure of what that may be, uh, this portal allows you to put in um, just your, your words and you'll be able to hopefully source that. It helps you to understand what are the relevant FTA that might apply to your product, depending on the market you may be looking at, uh, what rules re are required for you to meet the eligibility, and what documentation needs to demonstrate that. Uh, that covers the information I have. Uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share that with you. And thank you, Ross. Thanks, Wayne. Really interesting there, especially the stuff around those, uh, the FTAs, something that we don't often get to hear about. So next, and obviously the, uh, probably the most exciting speaker of the day is uh, Leon Scaliotis, who is the general manager of Flavortech. Um, Leon is the general manager and joined the Australian-based technology company in 2005. After expanding the profile and sales in Western Europe, Leon moved to the Australian head office in 2008, taking up the role of global sales and marketing director with his own territory of India and Southeast Asia. Excitingly, Flavortech were the New South Wales state winners at the Export Council Awards for the Manufacturing Category in 2017 and 18, and went on to win the National Manufacturing Category in 2018. Flavor Tech also won the 2020 Premier's New South Wales Export Council's Resilience Programme through what was a, a challenging year for the company. So I'll, uh, I'm excited to hear, obviously, Leon's, uh, Leon's presentation. And, and please, I encourage anyone to be dropping questions into the Q&A box for the panel discussion that will conclude after Leon's speech. Thanks, Leon. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ross. And just to confirm, can you see my screen? Hello? Hello? Hi, Leon. Yeah, we can see your screen. Uh, it's uh, probably not in presentation mode, though. It is in presentation mode, yes? Uh, it's, uh, we, okay. can see, we can see the whole PowerPoint window. Okay, wonderful. Thank you about that. And sorry about the, the internet connection. It's part of the issues with lockdown, I suppose. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me, Ross, and uh, thank you to Michael and to Wayne for, for their presentations. Today, I wanted to take people along on the 40-year uh, the journey of export that made Flavortech an overnight success. Um, it has been a long journey, and along that, Flavortech has learned uh, a lot of things, and I'm hoping to impart some of that knowledge to the exporters of the future and, and the exporters that are thinking about getting into the, the wider market now to, to help them, you know, do the best job possible as they go through. So I'm going to explain a little bit about Flavortech and key milestones of, of what Flavortech did to make us successful. So Flavortech is, is a company that's based in Griffith. Um, we manufacture and design bespoke unique equipment for the food and beverage and pharmaceutical industries worldwide, particularly for distillation, extraction and evaporation technologies. So it's our equipment often looks like what's shown there in the picture, um, which is one of our core technologies, the spinning cone column. Um, and we manufacture that in Griffith and export it and install it all around the world. Now we've grown over the years due to, to many things. And as I'll explain in my story today, uh, some, some of those things that have allowed us to grow is, is luck. And, and uh, luck does play a, a part in it, being at the right place at the right time. Um, we've also had to remain flexible. We've had to listen to our customers, but we've also had to keep our eyes and ears open to see what the market wants in, in order to, to have something ready for the market. Um, there's also been uh, a lot of planning that's been involved to allow us to get into new markets. And of course, with all of this, it's very important to obtain help at the right time um, when entering those new markets. Leon, so, uh, could, uh, just a moment, I think if you could, your PowerPoint's not popping into the presentation mode. So at the moment, we've still got that, uh, the, uh, the PowerPoint kind of screen with all your slides on rather than just the full screen. Right. 
Uh, you, you can hear me though? Or... Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. So, but you're not seeing any of my slides, is that? That's correct. Right, okay, so um, how do I get out of the presentation mode? You wanna keep, if, you want, if you'd like to keep talking to it, um, I'll share my screen now. Okay. So if you could stop sharing for me a second, and I'll, then I'll, I'll, yep. take, I'll take the mantle. Stop sharing, yeah, and I'll tell you when to change slides. Okay, can you see your screen now? Yep, thank you, Ross. Just going to the next slide. And the next slide after that. So, so yes, so Flavortech manufactures this equipment. Now, we're an engineering company, and uh, quite often we're competing against companies that have you know, 15,000, 20,000 people worldwide selling their equipment. We are a much smaller company, but we have developed some unique technologies. And, and one of the, the things that you know, I'd like to impart is, is the fact that you do have to present something new to your customers. For us, you know, our focus is based on producing a quality product for the customer in terms of their end product. And, and we talk about using short residence times and, and low temperatures to achieve that. So for examples, you know, there's evaporation technologies out there that take minutes, use high temperatures. Our evaporation technology takes only one second of heat contact time on the product. So it's quite unique, it's quite specific. It does, it, is, it does come at a different price point to some of the more economical technologies out there, but in terms of making a very special product that the customer can use to differentiate themselves in the market, it does play a large role. So having something that's unique, having a way to differentiate yourself from your competitors is, is a very important part of exporting. We always say that our goal is to improve the customer's business and um, we, we'd like to confirm that because 30 to 40% of our business every year is existing customers that are coming back because their business is growing. And, and that's really important because if your customer's business is, isn't growing, you, your business isn't going to grow. So we focus on that. And of course, we, we like to think we act and think globally. And if you can go to the next slide, please. So... We did start off in Griffith in, in Australia with a particular technology, but over the years we have seen and the need to actually grow into various export markets. So 30 something years ago, we set up a pilot plant and office over in the UK to look after our European customers. And over the last 30 years, we've also opened up and positioned people around the world to, to help us um, in our export journey. So you can see now we've got a pilot plant over in the US. Um, we've got territory managers in India, in um, Central America, and also in Europe. And over 90% of our equipment is exported. So it's very important to have people in the right time for our customers. And that's been part of the, the export thing. So if you're going to export you are going to have customers in different time zones and finding the right partners in, in those time zones is important. So we've got agents and distributors all around the world to help us achieve that. Uh, next slide. So, oh, just, just go back, just, yep. So in our export expansion, we did use the New South Wales government assistance for business matching. So, so Wayne did mention this uh, through Austrade, they, they do have offices in, in various areas. So in India, we, we did talk with Ramki there in Hyderabad who put us in um, contact with various uh, companies that were looking at uh, being agents for us. And we did the same in Central and South America as well. Um, and that was an important aspect of trying to find the right connections in, the, in those countries. Next slide. So to tell you a little bit of our journey, I have to discuss a little bit of our products. Next slide. So our core technology was the spinning cone column. Um, next, next slide. Um, the spinning cone column is, is a distillation piece of equipment. And it was developed because there was a need um, by our founder, who was a winemaker at the time, to desulfite grape juice. Now, he believed in this so much that he thought that he wasn't the only one that required that technology. Um, he heard about a 
this technology that was being uh, developed by the CSIRO over in Sydney and started talking to them and then used an EMDG grant to sort of commercialize it and, and start uh, and trying to start selling, selling it. Um, he built it on the back of a truck and drove around from winery to winery here in Australia, trying to promote it and show people how it works. And everybody said it was a great idea, but nobody had the money back in the late seventies and early eighties to, to purchase this technology. After a, approximately two years of doing this with quite a few knockbacks, he was just about to, to give it up. When a customer said, well, you know, this technology you have for desulfide and grape juice, do you think it could remove alcohol? Now he had nothing to lose and decided to give it a try. And not only was it very successful, but during that successful trial, he and his partner were standing by a part of the machine where these beautiful varietal aromas were coming out. And they both looked at each other and they said, maybe that's what we should be doing with this equipment, capturing those natural aromas. Now this got them thinking and this got them looking at other particular industries where this technology could be used. So even though it was developed for desulfiding of grape juice, you know, and we've only sold one in the last 35 years for desulfiding of grape juice, it did spawn the zero alcohol market. And we've been pioneers in that industry since, since the eighties um, and uh, are of course selling a lot now. Um, we persisted in that industry, even though a lot of wineries and a lot of beer companies were telling us, you know, who's gonna drink zero alcohol beer or who's gonna drink zero alcohol wine. These days, everybody's drinking it. But we also stayed flexible in that we realized that the one technology could do things for other people. And, and we were listening to, to what customers said. So that little pearl of wisdom really changed the direction of, of flavor tech. New slide. So, so now, that technology is used in the coffee industry worldwide. Um, we have over a hundred installations in instant coffee factories around the world where they capture the aroma early on in the process to add it back right at the end before it's made into a powder. Um, it's also used in the tea industry, specifically in the iced tea industry. So if you've been to America and even here in Australia and Europe um, as well, if you have an iced tea, there's probably you know, greater than a 50% chance that um, the iced tea has been brewed and, and the aroma is captured using that particular technology. New slide. Another technology that we, we produce and sell out of Australia is the Centrotherm evaporator. Now, this is, a, again, another particularly unique technology that only has one second evaporation time, but again, uses spinning cones, similar to the, the spinning cone um, column to produce a better product for our customers. Um, new slide. Yep. So this isn't, isn't a technology that we developed. Of course, we, we refined it, but we did acquire this technology approximately 20 years ago. And, and we liked what we saw with it in that it tied in very much with our philosophy of, of producing a better product for our customers. So we weren't looking at the time, but when we came across it, we thought what a great technology to, to bring on board and increase our profile, focusing on improving our customers end product. New slide. Another technology that we developed only a few years ago was the rotating disc column. Now the rotating disc column is a reaction column where we can control temperatures up to 200 degrees and, and, and the pressure within the unit, but it basically allows us to do something in 20 minutes that would generally take traditional systems hours. You know, one, one of these uh, applications is for cold brew coffee. You know, cold brew coffee normally takes 14 to 18 hours for that coffee to be extracted slowly. We can do that same extraction in 20 minutes. Um, so it was really us looking at the market and saying, hey, you know, customers are, are, are looking at ways to improve this or improve the time. What can we develop for that particular market? Um, it's also being used now for soluble coffee production, where previously they used to have to have a four story building with these huge extractors that would take two, three, four hours to extract the coffee. We can do it now in a single floor building taking only 20 minutes. So it's quite a unique technology. 
Now, if we were starting this again, we would probably get, try for, for another grant or a research grant or an export grant where we ask the New South Wales government for help. But it's, it's all about listening to customers and observing what customers are doing to actually help you develop more products for your portfolio. New slide. This is an interesting technology that we developed back in the 90s, and it really came about from a customer approaching us and saying, can you help us? You know, we have all these slow manual processes. We have people running around. We have forklift movements throughout the factory. How can we streamline this and, and, and have a more consistent product and have a better product? So we used two of our technologies um, and added some third-party technologies to produce a processing line that is continuous. This particular customer was in Japan. Um, at the time, they were seventh or eighth in terms of market share. And I'm happy to say now that they're actually number one in Japan for producing their canned coffee, which they're now exporting to other countries, including Australia. I've seen this recently. Uh, here in Australia being advertised and also in 7-Elevens. Um, and, and you think, well, canned coffee, you know, who's going to drink that? Well, you know, they're producing a million cans per day on each of the lines they have from us. Um, and it's all, it's all being consumed over in Japan where these vending machines are, are just about everywhere. Um, the same process line and, and this particular uh, photographs taken from a customer in uh, the US who started off with one line, bought a second line, bought a third line, and they're producing a lot of iced tea um, for companies all, all over the US. Um, and that includes not only bottled iced tea, but also, you know, in when you go to the um, fast food places and you can get your Coke, you can get your Fanta, you can get your iced tea. So quite high volumes, all done because we were listening to customers and tried to come up with a solution for one customer, which we then found was transferable to others. New slide. So it was developed in response to customer requests. So the industries we focus on now is not just new slide. It's not just new slide. It's not just that wine industry that we were looking at for desulfiding. We've expanded and, and we're looking at various industries. And we keep thinking to ourselves, you know, we've probably tried every application and, and we've tried different, all the different products that we ever can. But then the phone rings or we receive an email and there's a new customer with a new product that we've never tried before. Um, and we're always willing to give it a go. And, and I think that's part of the success story. You know, it's always about giving it a go and saying, and, and not saying no, seeing, seeing what's possible. That's allowed us to become, you know, leaders in the flavor industry, leaders in the coffee and tea industry, and, you know, and in the zero alcohol beverage industry as well. New slide. Now, flavor tech could have stayed in that wine industry. And, you know, and as you can see there, that alcoholic beverage industry for us, if you look at the last 10 years, is 13% of our business. So it would have been 100% of our business if we just focused there, but we'd be a much smaller company. And you can see now that the tea and coffee industry has far outstripped some of the other industries that we find ourselves in. And we never entered the market to export thinking that we'd ever be going into tea and coffee. But we like to keep the opportunities open and by looking at the big picture of how we can help customers. New slide. We're all around the world. Um, and this is really where we've sold our systems in, in the last 10 years. When we um, were looking 10 years ago to enter the Indian market, as I mentioned, we did approach uh, the New South Wales government uh, for some business matching. We also approached them to help us with um, uh, marketing grants so we can actually attend exhibitions, see what the market's like. I'm happy to say that the Indian market now is 12% of our business um, and growing. And the other, the other interesting um, point there is China. China has been growing for us. It was pretty much untouched by us up to 10 years ago. Um, I'm happy to say that we recently received an order for six of our large systems 
from one customer in China. I mean, that's how, how big things can get in China if, if you have the right product. Um, South America is a, another focus for us in the last three or four years. We have used the New South Wales government um, and Wayne specifically to help us with uh, business matching and marketing into that territory. Um, and that is starting to grow for us as well. We're actually starting a remote installation uh, this week for, for a company in Brazil. Um, so it is important that to, to recognize, however, that you can't just export everywhere at once. You've got to have the right partners and you've got to have a plan. You've got to take it step by step, building on your success and, and going from one place to another once you've established yourself and have the right partners in there. New slide. Of course, you've got to speak your customer's language. Um, many of us often receive emails that are in a completely different language um, that we don't have time to translate or, or see what it is and we hit delete. Well, it's going to be the same for your customers if you're going into mar markets where English isn't their first language. So use the assistance of uh, marketing grants um, to translate, hit new slide, to, to, translate, oh, to translate your brochures, um, to advertise in industry-specific magazines for your product, um, and also to go and explore exhibitions and conferences. Um, you know, the marketing grants can assist with having an exhibition booth, but I do know that the New South Wales government and Business New South Wales often have trade missions, and Flavortech has taken part in some of those trade missions to, to Saudi and also to India where they are used to network um, and find customers over there, but also to present yourself as part of a larger contingent of um, what you have to export and what you have to provide to those particular countries. So don't hesitate, um, use, use the money for translation purposes and, and use it to go and find your customers. New slide. Part of those exhibitions, I mean, for, for me, I always think um, you can have, you can travel somewhere, um, be there for one week, have 10 meetings, 20 meetings, but it pales into insignificance if you can get a speaking slot at a conference where you can present to 200 people or 300 people or 400 people and get your message across. So I always encourage our staff and our agents and our distributors to obtain speaking slots at conferences and exhibitions to be able to increase their profile to a wider group of people in that one time. So in the half an hour presentation, you can get your message across to multiple people. Um, it does cost a little bit more sometimes when you need to sponsor, um, but uh, it is well worth it. And of course, export success can lead to um, awards and happy to say that Flavortech has won awards in, in the last few years and really those awards should be promoted as much as possible and because it really builds your credentials with your new customers and we've seen people's face light up when you when we mentioned that we were the manufacturing category winner Australia wide in, in 2018. It really makes you appear a much larger um, supplier of goods to those particular customers. So we're using it as much as possible. New slide. New slide. Of course, you have to be able to show or demonstrate your, your um, products to customers. Um, if your product is small enough, you can always give it away. Um, our equipment is much larger and, and much more expensive. We can't just give it away for people to try. So, so we developed our pilot plants and you can see a, a photograph of one here where customers can send their products to us. And if it wasn't for COVID lockdowns and, and travel bans, you know, we normally have a revolving door week to week with customers from around the world coming and uh, bringing their products along so we can demonstrate the technology so they can see the difference our technology makes to their products. We have three pilot plants around the world and we've got plans for future ones as well. And it's very important to actually show your product. New slide. So the advice I have is find out about which countries you want to um, export to, find out the regulations, find out whether they've got free trade agreements, 
have a story about your product. Why would customers want to buy your product above your competitors? Have a uh, listen to pearls of wisdom that they may have. You know, they, they may tell you that somebody's looking for something very similar. See how you can be flexible and, and, and meet their requests and try and get any help you can. You know, the Export Council of Australia has some great um, uh, training sessions on uh, freight and uh, how to, to send products around the world. Austrade, New South Wales government have lots of information as you've heard from Wayne. And of course, there's universities and research institutes that you can also touch base with to find out how to get into different countries and how your product can succeed. And of course, there's other exporters, you know, you can always touch base with other exporters. How are they doing it? What are they finding successful? New slide. Um, Working on your elevator pitch is important because when you're going to these exhibitions, you want to network as much as possible. So have your promotional material ready in the right language and talk, 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 and try and mix as much as possible. And if you feel that you're the wrong person to do the talking, make sure that you employ the right people to get out there and help you sell. Lastly, you know, have determination, have persistence and faith. As I mentioned right at the start, this um, overnight success for Flavortech did take 40 years, um, but we finally got there and we are enjoying that success now. So good luck. Thank you. Leon, thank you. That was, that was really, really good. And, and I think we'll all appreciate. Uh, it was very insightful to hear how, especially kind of a, a business with a regional presence as well has taken that approach. I'm mindful, obviously, of time in terms of, uh, of having a panel. What I might do is a few people have asked questions, Leon, I'm mindful that we need to finish shortly, that we might just refer them uh, to you in directly, if that's okay, if, if anyone wants to reach out. Sure. Uh, look, I just want to take the time. Obviously, uh, those presentations were great, and, and it's about now, if we look at the, the people on the call today, it's about almost acting as a cohort, as opposed to work mm -hmm. together. So I'd like to thank Michael, obviously, from the AMGC. Michael, always a, always a pleasure. Uh, Wayne, thanks for taking the time. And obviously, we'll circulate Wayne's details uh, and the information is, is widely available as well on the relevant websites. And, and Leon, we do appreciate you taking your time out your busy day to give us a bit of, uh, of flavour tax backstory, a really interesting, really interesting piece. So on behalf of RSM, we will circulate this to everyone who's signed up. Uh, and likewise, please feel free to contact us, um, rsm.com.au, or likewise, feel free to reach out uh, to myself directly on either LinkedIn or ross.dixon at rsm.com.au if there's any way that we can help facilitate the network. And on that, hopefully, uh, I, don't know, I don't have a window in where I'm sitting, so hopefully we can go out and enjoy some sunshine and have a nice lunchtime. But thanks, everyone, for taking the time and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Appreciate it.